With every passing day, it becomes easier and easier to impersonate someone else's likeness. Now, there's times when this is used for art and entertainment, and it's great, but there's times when this has also crossed the line. In fact, we were recently paid a visit by William Osmond, and he told us a story where he had to deal with this exact thing. So that really inspired me to make this video because I want to arm people with the knowledge on how to spot fake synthesized people. So I called up one of my friends, who happens to be, in my opinion, one of the best deepfake artists on the planet, Chris Ume. And Chris will explain to us, how do you spot a deepfake? How do you break a deepfake? And can you even make a perfect, undetectable deepfake? And by the end of this video, we're going to try to answer perhaps the most important question under all of this. When is it okay to fake somebody? Let's go find out. Let's start with the story. Hi, Will. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the story. So you got some buddies, and there's people who are impersonating your buddies. I would say caricature impersonation. There's a channel called Now Red who does chemistry. Safety first. Well, no, it's just stupidity last. He is a friend of mine for the past three years. He's got a second channel, Now Blue. What the audience does is they go and they make Nile other colors. <laughs> There's Nile pink, Nile brown, and they're all kind of posts. Nile brown specifically. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but this young man made an account called Nile Green. No longer actually called Nile Green anymore. I think Mr. Green he changed his name to. The dude started creating some of the best parody deep bait content I have ever seen. Step one, find yourself a small container to hold the chemicals. Step two, this wasn't big enough, so I found a bigger container. I gotta say, his defect's pretty good. It's, it's, it was a very like confusing experience because it's so good. That... <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. It's like, oh, this exactly. is actually kind of good. We've had long conversations trying to figure out like, like how good is too good? Like, like, you've never had this issue before on the internet. Like, it's always been like bad enough that you could immediately tell it was like total BS. I think part of the issue is that the entire channel was packaged to look like one of Nigel's channels. So it's starting to depart from like, we're making a joke or a parody yeah. or satire to like, we're trying to like trick I'm people. Like I'm becoming this person. It's one thing to, to piggyback off of someone else, but then he goes, and you know, he does that Mark Rober video. They steal all my packages. Problem is, I don't know how to make better high class explosives. So last week I tweeted my home address. <laughs> it's the classic problem with deep fakes that I see immediately is just face and body shape don't match. You don't realize you know the body shape and face shape of someone until you see someone else's face shape but with their face, and you're like, ah, it's wrong. Looks like Mark Rober's meth head brother. <laughs> 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 Like, obviously, like, you can tell it's not Mark Rover, but watching this on your phone. You're like a kid. Yeah. Like, like a, like a six-year-old kid watching 360 this? 360p on, like, a cheap yeah. phone. <laughs> like, you're not going to be able to tell. He makes Mark Rover call one of the squirrels a bitch. Fat Gus was being a bitch and not moving, so I put that little where he belonged. I think it was really funny to see Mark Rover say bitch. <laughs> I also think that if I was Mark Rober, I would probably not be super happy with it. Like, if someone was making me say bad things, I mean, because you know, if you can make Mark Rober say bitch, you can make him say anything. Oh, you can make him say anything. And, and that's kind of like, well, if we're toeing that line, you can kind of, you know, see the progression of potentially getting worse and worse and worse. The dude led into a sponsored segment using Mark Rober. It's one thing if it was just some brand integration, but yeah. it was a very specific yeah. one that right. is kind of what made me feel kind of weird about it because it was a subscription box that is a direct competitor to the subscription box that Mark has. Yes. He knew where to draw the line. Like Mark Rober basically is about to say like this video is sponsored, but then it like cuts off and then the, the creator comes in and does the sponsor segment. And Ooh. It's like, oi, like, he's ew. like going around, he's like going to that cliff, like, eh, yes. like stopping and that's, that he knew, like, <laughs> he found that line, like, he went right to the edge of it because the videos are hilarious. It's just the, the entire thing that kind of starts to <laughs> become questionable. Yeah. Oh my so, while we're talking about deepfakes, I know somebody who is creating world class deepfakes, in my opinion, Chris Ume. And Chris and I met when we were both working for the South Park team briefly, kicking off Deep Voodoo, which is their, like, AI deep fake division. But since then you've got, gone on to create this company, Metaphysic. You guys have actually done some pretty impressive work. I started working on this TikTok channel named Deep Tom Cruise, where I created like artificial videos of a young Tom Cruise doing crazy things like eating a lollipop and all these kinds of things. I think there's bubble gum inside there. Yeah. All right, 
let's say I'm an internet detective and I'm like, all right, I have this shot and I, I don't know if it's a deep fake or not. So I'm gonna turn to one of the best artists I know who makes some of the most realistic deep fakes I've ever seen. What would you look for? If I handed you this piece of video, what would you look for to tell if it was a deep fake? There are a few specific things you can look at. First, there's like general expression. And in fakes, you always lose expression. And that's just a feeling. It is also very important to look at the shape of the face. I think the shape of the face is always a giveaway. Because if it's a celebrity, they're most likely using a lookalike. In a lot of cases, their measurements are not perfect. So you can look at the length of the forehead, the size of the chin, even the distance between the eyes. The best thing is to do just hold a picture next to it or a few pictures and start comparing, right? And also, are the eyes perfectly aligned? There is still an issue with a lot of fakes where the right eyes, for example, looking there and the left eyes like mm, in between somewhere, like it's not sure what it's doing. And it's like only in still frames that you can detect those. So it's something you can look at. A difficult thing as well is, is side angles. Whenever the face is moving, side angles are mostly the weak spot. And that's got to do with the type of facial extractions we have currently in general in a lot of these tools. There's also the Madame Tussauds effect because a lot of these models are not capable of doing these high, high, high quality resolutions yet. With the Madame Tussauds effect, you get this wax doll, like it's all enhanced and like it's, it looks real, but at the same time, it's like, um, it's like that uncanny valley, which you can feel uh, coming, uh, coming closer and closer. It's also difficult to fake ears. Oh because yeah. The ears are really specific for everyone. So there are not a lot of people with the same ears. And in Deep Tom Cruise as well, I'm not using Tom Cruise's ears. I'm using Miles' ears, like the actor. And it just makes it easier. <laughs> of course, the way the mouth is moving compared to the voice, it's, it's not perfect either. Besides quality issues, it's also the general blending, as in is the face matching, is the skin color perfect? But if you're working with experienced compositors, that shouldn't be an issue. I thought you just hit a button and it just happened. <laughs> like, what's the actual ratio of like an AI did the work versus like people sat down with a mouse and keyboard and did the work? I think currently is 50 50 is a fair is a fair way to say it. Like it's a lot of artistry and that's where the human touch comes in. No, our love was meant to be. So Chris, while we're on the subject of the challenging parts of replicating somebody's likeness, can you tell me what what, what did you do for America's Got Talent? We made Elvis Presley come back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Damn, that that looks like Elvis. I can really see the experience in how you set up this deep fake here because all the things that can break it, you've really controlled the environment not to have those things be an issue. It's working really well. It was also an honor that the, the estate gave us the possibility and trusted us to do this. Interesting, you didn't just you didn't just go, who should we do? Let's do Elvis! And you just grabbed pictures of him. You actually had to contact the estate and work through that process. Yeah. I think we had to have something like seven approvals. Wow. It's interesting, like the thought of going through all that effort to speak to his estate. Cause you know, like Elvis is a public figure. You can parody public figures, you can represent them. Like you can do fan films, you can do jokes. Like in this situation, you know, you went through the route of actually working with his estate and talking to them and getting their approval. One, and one factor there's the commercial side of it, right? It's gonna go on a show or it's gonna be run against advertisements. And so you start getting into exploiting of someone's image versus just satire. You weren't satirizing, you know, you weren't making fun or of Elvis or having a joke about him. You're actually trying to re replicate an authentic performance, like really capturing his vibe. And so if there weren't any legalities that you had to worry about or anything like that, let's say you were immune to being sued, would you still have gone through that process of talking to his estate? Yeah. I think it's very important that with all of these things, it's very important that you have consent for what you're doing. You cannot just bring someone back because you want to do that, right? It's not because you can do it that you should do it. That's the only way I, how I feel about it. Point your guns at me instead. There's no way we can communicate effectively when you have guns pointed at each other's heads. I wonder how Keanu Reeves feels about our video of him stopping a robbery by flipping a dude's neck a couple times. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's in that category where it's like, oh, it's obviously fake because it's all parody, it's all part of the right. story of that video, but it is still Keanu Reeves' likeness doing this stuff without his consent. Ke Keanu, right? At least it was just an impersonator's voice and not a full-on AI Keanu Reeves' voice. There's something about impersonation, though, where it's like, it's always imperfect. 
right? And a lot of times, it's almost funnier when it's imperfect. I agree. Like SNL, not saying SNL's funny, but <laughs> <laughs> the like the caricature impersonations yeah. are like there's like a lot of comedy and just sort of a really like kind of weird version of the person they're they're yeah. you, you know want you, want, you want one human's interpretation yeah. of the eccentricities of another yes. human. Taking it and making it like almost as perfect as it can get using, you know, like essentially mathematics yeah. mm -hmm. is that to me is the part that is a little bit too clean. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> You're yeah. simulating the human being. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like a lot of the, the viewers, like the audience, I think didn't quite understand why it would bother us and, and, and Nigel. And that took me by surprise because I think most people would probably be uncomfortable with someone else publishing you know, fake videos and photos of them. And that, that bothered me a lot, because like, I get it, I get it. Like, I understand why, like, I like the videos. If somebody made a parody of me and they made one video, I would be okay with that. If I started seeing like a pattern where it kind of felt like somebody was sort of jumping onto my back, it would make me very uncomfortable. I noticed that he only had five videos on his channel. He doesn't have any deepfakes on his channel anymore. Correct. Yeah. He just has deep voice. The deepfakes are gone, yeah. I got to give this guy props for navigating this because clearly he is putting effort into navigating it. Yeah. And he's trying to figure out where he sits. He's trying not to actually upset people. You know, it makes me actually a little proud that there's a good sense of community and culture here. It's, that's cool. So props to you, Mr. Green. I think, I think that he can make it work. He like has to kind of get the approval of the people that he's doing it of. With hyper real synthetic media, we're bridging that uncanny valley. It's really difficult to see the difference between what's real and what's what's not real. Satire is a really difficult thing, it's a gray area. Like, how far can you go? You cannot just make people say weird stuff and then make people believe it's them, right? If you want to utilize someone's image and you don't have the permission, like, you can't make it believable. You need to make sure it's like really yeah. a satire, a representation, a caricature, you know? At the end of the day, it's like, it's up to us as individuals and as artists and as an audience to really find what we feel is okay because it's the culture that you set that really establishes the rules that people follow. It would suck if we didn't set up the right community and culture around this tool because it can be used for so many interesting, positive things. If it's used for the wrong cases and it gets that kind of reputation and that's why people are using it, then it can just kind of torpedo this entirely new, like growing art form. Yeah, I, I'm excited to see what happens. I'm just glad I didn't have to be the, uh, the face that started the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it. A really interesting conversation with two really interesting people. But it doesn't just end with them. I wanna hear what you guys think. The synthetic media, it's this crazy new thing, it's here to stay. And what are some really cool things that you've seen done with it? What would you like to see done with it in the future? As always, consider subscribing. Really appreciate all of you watching this video and engaging in the discussion with us. We're gonna keep trying new things as we move forward here.